everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Rachel Ray and today is Theory Tuesday, aka welcome to the weird and wacky and wonderful with Mr. Ray. Hi everybody. <laughs> uh, today we're going to be talking about cryptids. We haven't talked about cryptids in a while and uh, we're just getting back into the spirit of things. So um, if you haven't seen it already, I'm going to put it here on the screen. I'm currently cross-stitching this project called the Creepy Cryptid Stitch Along by the Witchy Stitcher. And um, it's super cute. <laughs> Actually, like each individual drop, it comes out once a week, except for she gives us the last week off at the end of the month. And anyway, each week there's a new cryptid. James insists that some of them aren't but anyway, <laughs> um, James is going to regale us with some really fun information about cryptids this week. I'm assuming. I know, yeah, I mean, it, it's not just me that says it. I mean, like, they're, they're really cool and they really pick r the right stuff, you know? Well, then what, what makes a cryptid a cryptid? A, a cryptid is um, an animal that's, that's hitherto unknown to science, you know? Yes. Um, so as such, it has to be believable as an animal. Okay. You know, so like, um, what was the name of that three-legged one? Oh. That was a kangaroo. The... Uh, I can't remember. The infield horror. Yes, the infield horror. Like, <laughs> look, that's either a kangaroo or, or something. It's not a cryptid. Or a very scary because nightmare. there's no three-legged animals. You know? Yeah. Like, it just doesn't happen. And that uh, that's that's the final. And then there's other ones as well, like the the, the leg guys, what are they called? The night crawlers? Yeah, the, the haunted pants. <laughs> like, you know, that's more than likely someone from the Draco system or their allies, the Mantis, <laughs> than it is a cryptid. Do you know what I mean? Like... The Draco system. It's, if you haven't seen our older videos, please check out the playlist. There's no, there's, it's no laughing matter, Rachel. I know, I know, it's I know. The, the, they're the the evil the, ones. The like. Dracos or their or their buddies, the Mantids, who's who I'm told by those in the know, their intentions are a little harder to discern. Ooh, that's what I'm told. Ooh, we um, may have to look into them. So. And I mean, let's. The, so the 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 first one we were going to talk about today is the Kelly Hopkinsville goblins. Mm -hmm. Now, the very name itself suggests that this is not a cryptid, because they've described it as a goblin. Okay. You know, like goblins aren't animals; they're magical creatures. Okay. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, yeah, you're right. In the way that we're animals, but like, if you, if a goblin walked in here, with its silver spacesuit on it, you wouldn't be like, "Oh, look at that cryptid." Goblins like, wear silver spacesuits. These ones do, yeah. Oh. These ones do. Okay. Do you not remember? We, we talked about this before. Do you want? Will we go through it again? Let's yeah, go. go on. Refresh my mind. This is this is the incident where. Uh, the term "little green men" kind of entered into um, the, the, the like the, pop culture. Yeah, entered into the the cant like the parlance, you know. Okay. Entered into normal usage, like. Mm -hmm. um, and it's re it's really kind of where where this idea of aliens, you know, previous to the greys, which are the ubiquitous aliens now, you know. You can't call them greys. Well, that is actually a slur, yeah. Um, our space brothers, previous to our space brothers. Um, so, and it's, it's you know, it's almost like where um, Marvin the Martian comes from and stuff. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so, what it is anyway, it, it took place on August 21st, 1955, yeah? Yeah. And there's this, um, well, we're not going to get into it again because we got into it previously. <laughs> But there is some kind of social gathering going on. That's a hoot nanny. <laughs> it could be a jamboree or a hoot nanny or it could be a hoedown. We don't know. We really don't know. We do know the difference. Um, there is a difference, yeah. 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 Like yeah. you wouldn't have children at a hoot nanny, but you could have them at a jamboree. Right. Possibly a hoedown if it was early mm. in the evening. Early, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've established all that. And it's all members of the same family, you know? Yeah. And... Um, 
Yeah, they're they're in Hopkinsville, which I believe is in West Virginia. Is it? Is it? Is it in Pennsylvania? Uh Ugh, look, you would think that I would write something like that in my notes, wouldn't you? These notes are pretty uh, famous. famous. (laughs) These famous notes of mine, yeah. Um, So the the story is right. It's it's August twenty first, nineteen fifty five. Yeah, and these this car pulls up like a, you know a what would you call it, a truck pulls up outside the cop shop yeah. in Hopkinsville mm-hmm. and um, out jump eight adults and three children. Now I'm going to assume it's one of those flatbed Ford jobbies and they're all in the back or something, you know? Mm-hmm. But anyway, there's a whole shot of people and they all jump out and they've got this crazy story, you know? Now, this is the um, the Sutton family, yeah? Yeah. Um, there's Elmer Lucky Sutton and his wife Vera there's Billy Ray and June Taylor, and they all work together as carnies, you know? So they're traveling around the country, working, setting up carnival rides and yeah. setting up these fairs, you know, these traveling carnivals. Carney is a slur, James. I, is Carney a slur? Oh, I'm, oh I'm, um, It I might not be, but it sounds like it could be. Well, yeah, okay, all right. So they're carnival workers. Thank you. All right. Okay. So they're carnival workers and they're, it's the off, well, I don't know if it's the off season. August seems like prime season. But either way, this this couple, Elmer Lucky and uh, Vera Sutton and uh, Billy Ray and June Taylor, they work together. They're on a, they're on a visit to um, Elmer's brother, uh, John Charlie, who they call J.C. Sutton. Um, O.P. Uh, Baker is Vera's brother. There's this lady called Glenny Langford, and she's the matriarch of the family, mm-hmm. of the Sutton family. Um, she's since re- remarried. That's why her name has changed. And then there's five children. Um, it, it's unclear who the children, probably Glenny and um, and uh, J.C. Sutton, you know? That they belong to those people. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So all, all you need to know is like that it, it's a small, it's like a two a two room shack, uh, no indoor plumbing, no lighting. You know, hmm. it's nineteen fifty one. It, it's out rural. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a whole shot of them, and they're sitting around playing cards. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then Billy Ray Taylor gets up and he goes outside to get some water from the well. Mm-hmm. And he comes back in saying, you guys are not going to believe this. I saw this multicolored um, light go down behind the mountain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people are like, oh, yeah, sure you did, Billy Ray. And he goes, no, no, no. Like, it looked like it flew down behind the mountain. And there was all different kinds of light coming out of it, you know. Um, So they're they're playing the cards. And the dog is outside and the dog starts barking. Yeah. Yeah. And then they're all like, oh, shut that gosh darn dog up, you know. (laughs) And all that sort of thing. And um, so eventually, uh, Billy Ray and Elmer go outside, yeah? Yeah. To see what's going on. Did they bring guns? Um, they they definitely <laughs> brought guns, yeah. They have a pistol and a shotgun, I believe. Okay. Um, and they go outside to see what's going on. Two minutes later, they run back into the house. And they're like, oh my goodness, blah, blah, blah. There's things coming up the line. And then... Basically, for the next few hours, they're sitting in the house and they reckon they're fending off an attack from these little goblin creatures. They're about three and a half feet tall. Mm -hmm. They've got these big oversized head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they've got um, arms that reach almost to the ground. Hmm. And instead of hands, they have talons. And then they've got these uh, oversized eyes that glow with this kind of yellowish light, you know? Yeah, um, and it, what takes place is something like, uh, you know, it's a siege on the house. Right. They're shooting out the door, bang, 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 at these <laughs> creatures. Yeah. And uh, they keep coming and they keep shooting. And then eventually in a lull in the fighting, mm-hmm. that's when they hop in the into the uh, truck and they drive down to the cop shop. And um, and that's that's basically it. So then the police, the next day, the police are like, the police basically when they tell them the story yeah yeah this is at 1 a.m they've got five tired children there's a load of adults there you know Mm -hmm. and they tell the cops and the cops are like get out of here with your crazy stories you know yeah and then basically they head off yeah 
Then the next day, the cops rock up to the house, um, but everybody's gone. Like, and they were saying that they came back. They were worried about getting attacked again, so they so they ran. You know. Mm-hmm. Um. Check so check it out. Like, so the the next morning, who comes down right to visit the house? After considering that they told them get out of here with your crazy story. There's four city police officers, five state troopers, three deputy sheriffs, and four military police from the nearby Fort Campbell. Hmm. Yeah. So Suspicious. Yeah, we talked about how suspicious this is. I mean, like, even if you were like, hey, you better go down and check that out, or we better follow up on that just to be thorough, you know? They might send you two would, cops. You would send two cops. Maybe. Like, you'd send a guy in a car, wouldn't you? Right. You know? Yeah. And he'd get it, get to the place and radio back into the office, and he'd be. And like, this is in the fifties. It's not like. This is in nineteen fifty one. Yeah. <laughs> and you you like nineteen the nineteen fifties to me, seem to be, this time, um, where, everything is possible. You know, mm-hmm. magic is still a thing, mm. but so is science. Science is becoming a thing. We harness the atom, man. You know? Yeah. Um, check out my Timex watch. It's radioactive. I can read it at night. That's a real thing. That's that's mm. a real thing that used to happen, you know? Oh, yeah. Didn't a bunch of women die? Um, because of the poisoning of the... Yeah, yeah. I believe they called them the radium girls. Yeah. And they used to paint the watch faces. Um, yeah. <sighs> and the when it became apparent that radioactivity was very bad for you, uh, they fought them tooth and nail in court. Um, thank God stuff like that doesn't happen anymore. To keep their jobs or for them to keep to working? To stop them from, from suing them for medical con- uh. for medical fees and for uh, just generally, I mean, like their life was over. They'd just been given a... Yeah. Uh, you know what? Um, and then we, when we were talking about this before, I think we might have suggested that what had happened here is that the sheriff's office had phoned the army you know mm-hmm. and the army were like what that's nothing to do with us also get a load of men from several different law enforcement departments <laughs> we need to go down there and talk to these kellys you know? <laughs> or go down there and talk to these suttons okay um so that's kind of it like you know um they retell the story then a number of times over the years you know mm-hmm. but i've got to stress this again like Billy Ray's original description of the thing, I have this in my notes, was he said he was out at the wall, well, you know, and then he saw a bright light streak across the sky and disappear beyond the tree line some distance from the house. Mm-hmm. Later on, when he was tracked down and asked about it again, um, he said that, oh, it was a silvery object, real bright, and it had an exhaust coming off of it that was all the colors of the rainbow. Hmm. But that's not a cryptid that arrived in a car. Do you know what I mean? Or or a spaceship? Like like cryptid, right. cryptids are animals. Do you know? Like if well, you, they said that they saw the goblins. Yeah. Well, like if you came into a clearing, right? You're out, you're up walking in the Pacific Palisades or something, you know? Mm-hmm. And you come into a clearing, and there's um, Bigfoot taking a selfie. Do you know what I mean? Like that's you can't picture that, can you? Like <laughs> well, kinda, you know? yeah. Or he's he's there giving out about his online banking. It's like you, you know things were easier when you could just go into the branch. You know what I mean? <laughs> now they need you to do all these things online. It's terrible. It's terrible. Uh. Um. So I I, I I guess that's what I'm saying. Like the the Kelly Hopkinsville. I mean, what is it like? Is it is it an alien? Is I think it's it a, a gremlin. Is it a gremlin? But again, it, it seems to have arrived in a vessel. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, maybe it's a time machine. Yeah, or, you know, maybe it's it's just the uh, knock-on effect of hard jamboreeing. You know? or uh, Are you trying to say that they were drunk? <laughs> reckless hootenanny. Well, you wouldn't be drunk at a jamboree. I think we established that. But a hootenanny or a hoedown easily. Yeah. Uh, definitely a hootenanny. A hundred percent. Yeah. A hootenanny. Whew. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's an interesting story, but I, I don't know if it's a, if it's a cryptid. <laughs> you, um, 
I will leave that up to the audience. I don't, I don't think that, I mean, it's... I think you're taking this way too literally. I just, you know what, Rachel? I didn't get an imaginary degree in imaginary animals to, to be <laughs> standing around here discussing the Kelly Hopkinsville goblin. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, if you would like to see the original video of that, I will make sure that I link it. Uh, because it was very funny. I think I have a, a doctorate in zoomorphology. I don't know what you have, but it, it's funny. <laughs> I don't know what, uh, yeah, I don't even actually know what morphology sounds. I just fancy the sound of it, like morphology. Is that like, uh, is that what, va not vampires? Well, vampires too, and werewolves have. I think it's some, I think it's so, what, mor morphology. Morphology. I think it's something to do with, like, comparative, like comparing things to each other. Hmm. Anyway. Right. Um, I guess the next thing we're going to talk about is a Yeti. A Yeti? Yeah. Aww. Now, Yeti, undoubtedly a cryptid. Yes. Undoubtedly a cryptid. Um, and there's some, uh, there's some kind of, um, uh, there's some knowledge of it in the, in the kind of folklore and stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and you know where we're talking about, like, the Himalayas, you know? Right. Nepal, Tibet, that sort of thing. Um, actually, mostly Nepal and Tibet. Not Alaska. Uh, no, not Alaska. No. Um, and this, the these, there's some like pre-Buddhist beliefs and stuff, you know. Um, oh yeah. There's said, yeah. There's like, there's this one group um, who believe in a, like they have mythologies about a wild man that lives in the mountain who's the god of the hunt. Hmm. You know. Um, there's another religion I believe called the Bon. Or maybe bon, bon, bon. Um, but they they believe that using a wild man's blood in a ritual, ritualistic kind of way, or it's pretty it's pretty unclear. It's just a line of it. But there is some um, pre-Buddhist belief in it. You okay, know, it, mm -hmm. it exists in the in the mythology. It's all in the folklore. <laughs> Yeah, but not to not to such a, because I read another thing by one of these guys that was basically an explorer, and like an explorer or colonizer, depending on what you want to talk about it or call it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But saying that he was up in the Himalayas and his guides were telling him about this wild man. He goes, but like invariably, no one in no one he had ever met had actually seen one. But they had a story about their cousin's friend. Right. Who had this boyfriend who, who <laughs> saw one one time. You know that kind of way? Yeah. And he said that no one, that, that despite years of questioning and while he was living there, no one had ever actually claimed to have seen it, you know? Right. But I guess the modern, um, the modern kind of version um, starts at kind of the start of the 20th century, about 1925. Mm -hmm. There's this guy, um, N.A. Tombazi who's a photographer and he's a member of the Royal Geographic Society and he talks about they were up surveying a glacier mm -hmm. at about um, 15,000 feet which would be about 4,600 meters um, on a heat they were surveying the Zuma glacier and he says that while he was on the glacier he looked across it and it was maybe three or four hundred yards mm -hmm. Um, which is maybe 250 meters, that kind of way, you know, mm -hmm. so a quarter of a kilometer away. But he saw this figure and he said it was unquestionably the figure in outline of exactly that of a human uh, walking upright, stomping occasionally, uh, sorry, stopping occasionally to pull at some dwarf rhododendron bushes. And um, it showed up dark against the snow. Um, and as far as I could make out, it wore no clothing. So this version of the Yeti is naked is well, like, again, if you came upon that clearing in Washington state and Bigfoot was there and he had like a really nice Dior suit on, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's it just doesn't make any sense. So, again, I'm going to have to say if it's wearing clothing, which the Kelly Hopkinsville guys wore, they were supposed to be wearing silver kind of jumpsuits, you know, if it's wearing clothing. It's not a cryptid because that's not something that animals do, do you know? Quite aside from pugs on the internet and stuff, you know? <laughs> um, but animals in the wild, they're not like, oh, it's getting cold. I got to get myself a new jacket. You know, I got to get a proper, proper one with the down in it. <laughs> um, 
So that's so that's that's the crack with that. So that kind of starts, and then he said that as that expedition, the expedition in 1925 was leaving the mountain, mm-hmm. they came across loads of footprints in the snow. Okay. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, then that kind of, you know, that simmers under the surface for a while, mm-hmm. and then real serious hardcore yeti fever, which there is no known cure to. No. Um, starts in 1951. Of course. Of course. Um, do you know who Edmund Henry is? I feel like I do. Um, do you know who Tenzing Norgay is? No. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Um, Off the top of my head. But those names sound familiar. Ed- Edmund Henry is a guy from New Zealand. Um, who is reputed to be the first person to climb um, Everest. Ah. And Tenzing Norgay is the Sherpa, who's a native of Nepal, who is supposed to have... Um, Actually been the first. There's, like, that's a conspiracy theory for another day. But, <laughs> but a lot of people think that that's what the crack was. Ah, uh, come on. Well, I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't want to talk about it or anything, but, like, because I haven't actually looked into it or anything, okay. but I know that that apparently one of um, Norgay's uh, maybe grandsons or something like that, one of his direct descendants, mm-hmm. said that he told him one time that um, Edmund Henry wasn't as tough as he seems, and that he was getting delirious from oxygen, um, lack of oxygen at that altitude, yeah, and that he basically dragged him up the last couple of hundred meters up to the top. Hmm. Or, you know, something like that. Like, I don't think as well that you can really underestimate how good m- modern clothing is. Yeah. Do you know? Yeah. Like, when you see these guys that were, like, down in the South Pole, you know, like yeah. Scott and people like that, like, they were down there with woolly jumpers. Do you know what I mean? And instead of waterproof, they had canvas that was rubbed with paraffin wax. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, you'd be down there, your North Face jacket is a million times better than anything these polar explorers had. Do you know? So, and again, that's going to go pretty much for these guys trying to climb. Talk about the 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 whale bladders. The whale bladder. uh, A whale bladder filled with oxygen is what they had, like stuff like that. Um, so, So that's the crack. So anyway, when they were surveying the mountain um, in the 50s, yeah, this guy called Eric Shipton was part of the um, expedition. Okay. Yeah. And they're up there, they're surveying the mountains. And then he fancies that about 600 meters up, which is 20,000 feet, um, he took some photos of a Yeti foot. Yeti foot? Yeah. A footprint? Yeah. Or a lone foot. <laughs> a cut off foot. It, it's a, it, it was actually a trail <laughs> of footprints, like, but I've just, I've, I've got the photo if you want to have a look at it, like. Do you notice anything unusual about it? The big toe is smaller. It's only got three toes. Yeah. And this is, this is part of the morphology of the Yeti. Okay. That it has three toes. Another characteristic, like if you picture a Bigfoot, right? Mm -hmm. But with three toes and a pointy head. Like it's got... Pointy? Yeah, it's got a kind of cone head on it. Oh, okay. Um, That's basically what your Yeti is. Now, I didn't want to put photos in here. Lots of photos in here. But you can actually Google um, Edmund Hillary and the Yeti and see a picture of Edmund Hillary holding a picture of the Yeti. And really? Yeah, yeah. And that's your classic Yeti stuff there. Hmm. Um, but I don't want to put too many, too many photos in it like that. So you can okay, see... Okay, wait, wait, wait. Can I just slow down for a second? Yeah, okay. What's the difference between the Yeti and the Abominable Snowman? Uh, the Abominable Snowman is another name for the Yeti. Um, I believe a journalist, um, when these things started to come out in the 50s... Mm-hmm. I believe the first report, it might have even been Eric, what's his name's, they sent it down and they had it like it was written in some other language and what they had was like the fearful or something like that and the guy mistranslated it as abominable. It was the abominable snowman. 
to the the fear fearful snowman. Yeah, something like that. And they but that's not what I'm asking. <laughs> but what's the difference? What's the difference? Like, is there a difference? There, like the Yeti is actually the name for it in one of the Nepalese or Tibetan languages, you know. But if you go on the Wikipedia page, mm-hmm. you can actually see a whole list of the people that live in this valley call it this, the Dura, whatever, you know what I mean? And they're usually mixtures of this man bear. For real, like, so the man bear of the mountain, or you know what I mean? This one is the... I mean, the call thing. it what it is, like... Yeah, exactly. So there, so that's the crack. But the story is, it's it's basically like a, a Himalayan uh, Bigfoot, you know? Mm. Because, you, you know, there's an Australian version as well called the Yowie. Oh. Um, and the Yowie also appears in... Um, it appears in uh, Aboriginal, Australian Aboriginal um, folklore and stuff like that. You know? Is it is it also a snow-based monster or? Um, no, the Yowie isn't. Uh, the Yowie is, is is like out in the outback, usually in like arboreal kind of places. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, but you can get it in different places as well. Hmm. Um, Interesting. Yeah, it's just another wild man. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so. Then anyway, that's that's the story. Like to this day, that that photograph of um of the of the footprint mm-hmm. is supposed to be some of the best evidence, and also the trail of footprints together. You know, is some of the best evidence for for a, the existence of the yeti, or is considered the best evidence for the existence of the yeti, for real. Hmm. Um, the nineteen fifties then sees an absolute rash because there's more interest as well you know yeah because that guy eric um uh, eric what's his name s- s- uh, <laughs> whatever his name was that dude yeah <laughs> i can't i can't I, can, I gotta go back in my notes hang on i'll go back in my notes then rachel <laughs> where's his name eric shipton okay i should really start praising the people's names Eric Shipton, anyway, was a member of the the kind of the first party that were going down there, and they were going to work out a route up and you know survey the area and stuff like that. Uh-huh. And then Edmund Hillary rocks up, and he's going to climb it, and that's in 1953, you know. Yeah. Um, so when they come down from the mountain, and um, Edmund Hillary and and Tenzing Norgay, you know, mm-hmm. they say that um, that they saw Yeti footprints up there. Um. And then Edmund Hillary kind of becomes interested in it, you know? Yeah. And he makes a few comments to the effect of, oh, you know, it could be possible or whatever, yeah? And then Tenzing Norgay um, makes statements along the lines of, oh, well, everybody knows it's real. No, I've never seen it, and no one I know has ever seen it, but my dad, who, who passed away a while ago, um, he's seen it twice, you know? <laughs> And this is this is exactly what the other guy was saying is that you know you question people and they're like oh it's well known it definitely exists. Are you sure this isn't just something that your parents told you to keep you from getting in trouble? A hundred percent. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't ever climb above eight thousand meters. <laughs> <laughs> it's like solid advice. Eight thousand meters. Yeah. Is that even possible? Um, I don't know. I think <laughs> eight thousand. Yeah, isn't isn't? I thought you said six hundred was. Where they found the footprints. No, 6,000. Oh, sorry. Okay, right. Which is six kilometers from sea level. Like. Yeah. Very impressive. Um, so they, Tenzing Norgay then makes that comment that, you know, he's never seen one personally, but his dad has. And, you know, unfortunately his dad can't corroborate that because he passed away a while ago. Yeah, he so did. That's, yeah, that's the crack. Um, so that's, that's what's going on then. Um... There is also um, report, purported to be, um, oh my God, my notes, purported to be um, this, the skull and a hand of a Yeti, yeah? A skull and a hand? Yeah. Oh, a skull, okay. And they were kept at a monastery called uh, Pangboshe Monastery. And Pangboshe is in Kumanyang, I think you would pronounce it. Or, yeah. Kum, Kumjong, maybe, monastery. Um, but basically, yeah, it's it's in Kumjong Monastery in the town of Pangboshe, I think. 
I could be wrong on all these. But anyway, this Buddhist monastery claims to have a Yeti skull. Mm-hmm. Um, not a Yeti skull, but a Yeti, Yeti scalp. Hmm. So literally just around above the ears, it has that. And it's distinctly cone shaped, you know? Okay. And it also said that it had the hand of a Yeti. A Yeti's hand. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So then in um, on March 19th, 1954, yeah. Um, the Daily Mail. Do you know that August publication in Britain? <sighs> Do I? Yeah. So real. Uh, you can see that they solid journalism. Even at that time, they had they had the. Um, what am I going to say? Even at that time, they were known for the quality of their journalism, and they sent a team over. Well, they didn't send it, but they covered a story where a team went over to test. The thing, so they took the skull cap out, you know. Okay. And in the room that it's kept, it's kept in a little glass box. It had all the, the hair looked black and stuff, but when they took it outside into the sunlight, it looked ginger. Ooh. Because that's not exactly what you picture with an abominable snowman, is it? It's white. It's white fur. But yet. Is it? Well, what do you picture? I 100% picture white fur. Well, yeah. I, uh, yeah. Yeah? Abominable snowman. It, it's sort of like a... Because see, like, when I say, when when you say Yeti, mm. I see Bigfoot. Yes. But when you say abominable snowman, I see the claymation film Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Uh, yeah. And what's his face with the pickaxe? Yeah, you know, <laughs> like, ba- I think basically, like, a Yeti is, like, a really angry uh, Bigfoot. You know, you always see a Yeti, it's like, Brr, whereas Bigfoot is, like, loping off into the woods, you know what I mean? <laughs> just trying to get out of way, get out of the yeah, yeah, camera. Yeah, yeah, just got to get out of frame, like, you know? Yeah. Whereas the abominable snowman is like, Brr, I will kill you all, or whatever, I don't know. Do you know? So... But anyway, they test all this. I'm really hungry and I don't have any clothing. Give me your North Face jacket. They they take the scalp from from this monastery, you know, mm-hmm. and they test it and they can't identify it. No. Yeah. Yeah. They're not trying hard enough, James. But but they did say it probably came from a hoofed animal, just judging by the... Hoofed? Hoofed animal. Hoofed? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's the crack. Then, like, so that's about the mid-50s, you know? Yep. Yeti fever starts sweeping through the place, yeah? And there's so many um, people going going to uh, Nepal and to Pet and the Himalayas mm-hmm. to try and, and catch a Yeti that the U.S. State Department actually releases information on the protocols. <laughs> like, they release a list of things you should do if you're Yeti hunting. What? Yeah, for real. There's so many people going. I thought over. you were gonna say that they placed like a a travel restriction or something. No, no, no. The State Department s- steps in and they're like, "Oh, Yeti hunting, eh?" <laughs> <laughs> so there's here's here's three simple Let's help. three simple rules, right? First of all, obtain a permit from the Nepal Nepalese government. Always obtain a permit. Always obtain a permit. Second one, do not harm the Yeti unless it's in self defense. So you've got to get a permit and do no harm to the Yeti, yeah? Got it. And the third one is, when you find the Yeti, the Nepalese government gets final say on how the information is released to the public. Yeah, yeah you can't just be talking about this willy-nilly. Like. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's absolutely, yeah. So, they've, so they've, done, they've done that. They've released all these rules about getting the Yeti, yeah? Yeah. Do you remember... Do you remember... Do you remember the hand I said was with the scalp? Yes. Apparently, in 1959, that was smuggled out of Nepal <laughs> into <kidding>. India <laughs> and then smuggled from India back to the United States. Oh. Yeah. Hang on. This is like a CIA. Sorry. Smuggled from India back to, Lon- to London. To London? Oh, okay. And then it's gone missing. Oh. Do you know who smuggled it? In 1959? MI5. 
a little guy called James Stewart. The actor. The famous actor. What? Jimmy Stewart is reputed to have smuggled a Yeti hand. No way. Out of India. Yeah. He just wanted to pull like an Indiana Jones or something? Like, I have no idea what? how he got involved in it. Like, <laughs> That's... I was wish I wish I was good at doing impressions because he's one of the guys he's one of the famous impression guys doesn't he like is he? an impression of him Jimmy Stewart oh god yeah. he's the guy that was in It's a Wonderful Life right It's a Wonderful Life yeah. yeah I think that's the only place I know him from well no that and um, How to Kill a Mockingbird I think uh, was he in that To Kill a Mockingbird was it Yeah he was yeah yeah that's him in that yeah To Kill a Mockingbird. Yeah. I say how to. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, <laughs> um, Sir Edmund Hillary comes back into the story then at the at the um, end of the fifties and the start of the sixties. Mm-hmm. So he he'd made a couple of statements about the Yeti and he believed there was something in it and all these kind of things, you know. Right. So then in in nineteen sixty and sixty one, he funded this um, expedition called the Silver Hot Expedition. And they sent people to the um, Himalayas to collect and analyze physical evidence. So okay. they're traipsing around the Himalayas and they're trying to find footprints and they're trying to find, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, in many it's ways, it's a hard thing to a, do. It's a tougher environment than, than Bigfoot's environment because like, yeah. first of all, you don't have trees in the way, so you can see much further. Okay. Both. But then you can only see the valley you're in, not the other one. You know? Yeah. Um, there's snow everywhere, like it's snow. <laughs> so it's tough, like it's tough. It's tough, lads. So they're around and they don't find anything to photograph. They don't find any fur anywhere because, like, fur won't get caught in the snow. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, like a bigfoot fur, you can find it on a tree bow or whatever. Yeah. Or is it, oh, I see. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like it'll it, it, it'll uh, just blow away. Yeah, exactly. But anyway, no footprints, nothing, nada. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then they're thinking, well, let's go to this, um, let's go to this monastery. Mm-hmm. They get to the monastery, and they say, we want to see your yeti stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Show us like, your yeti stuff. Here's the scalp. <laughs> We're big fanboys. <laughs> Wait until I get the hand. It was around here a minute ago. That Hollywood guy was over looking at it. <laughs> um, so anyway, all they've got is the is the skull cap. Yeah. Yeah. So then Edmund Hillary convinces... Scalped a ginger. Yeah, convinces a Sherpa, like the headman of the village there that the monastery is in, uh-huh. to, to travel with him to London where they can um, examine the scalp in detail. Mm-hmm. They travel to London and they take a few small samples and they start to compare it to samples of skin that they have in the... Uh, British Museum mm-hmm. or the Museum of National History or something you know? right they science it up anyway big time and um, when they compare it to it they say that it it is definitely mammal and they said that anyway because okay. of the fur and stuff yeah uh, it's definitely mammal and they think that it might be a cero oh. they, they think it might have come from the shoulder of a thing called a cero which is a kind of Nepalese mountain goat. Oh. So if you can imagine the goatiest goat going. <laughs> that's what it, because like. <laughs> what does the, can you describe what you well, look, call the goatiest goat the going? Him, <laughs> like goats are mountain creatures, right? Yeah. And the Himalayas are the biggest mountains. In right? the world. Yeah. In the world. So therefore, the any goat, goat, any specific goat that lives in the Himalayas has got to be king of the goat. This is one big goat. And that's why I would describe it as the goatiest goat going. <laughs> so that's, that's big. And then I think after that, boat. like after that then, interest in kind of, in the Yeti and stuff fades a little bit, you know? Um, because they never, you know, there's loads of people. Like the Russians claimed about 10 years ago that they caught one. In uh, Siberia, you know, mm-hmm. um, and then they were asked to produce it, and they were like, "We're not showing no, you." No, but it was definitely here. Igor saw it. Do you know that kind of way? Like, so I mean, it's the th- the thing that gets me about the Yeti as well is that they always picture it as having three toes. You know. 
Yeah. But that's that's not how primates operate. Primates no. don't. There's no primates with three toes. They all have five toes. In fact, it's so big within that area of um, mammal uh, biology that even whales are a part of that and they always have five fingers. Yeah, and they're flippers. Yeah, exactly. Do you know what I mean? So it's so a, a three-toed one is a bit unusual. They say that it could be these guys, the cerros, because they're cloven-hooved animals and that they step in the snow and then as the snow melts, it just basically widens it and makes it look like a massive footprint, you know? Hmm. Maybe the toes are up a bit. Uh, yeah. But but what I will say, Yeti, 100%, like 100% cryptid. That's what a Yeti is. Do you know? But it has three toes. Yeah, that's... So it's, it can't be real. That's fine. It can be a cryptid. Like, no. No, it, if the Enfield Horror has three legs. But there's... And you big, could cut off a leg. But it doesn't necessarily have to be a primate. But then bears are 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 members of the same mammal class, and they'll have five. You know what I mean? Am I right? Do they have five? Yeah, they must have five. Well, bears. They must, yeah, they must too. Because even dogs. What are you doing? I'm I'm just that I I didn't want you to have a a stray diamond thing. Um. <laughs> Because even even dogs have five, right? With the with the one that's halfway up their shin or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. No, wait. Yeah. Luna. Well, look, Ray. Your foot. I one, have an imaginary two, degree in three, in zoomorphology. Why you do have five toes? What a good girl. Yeah, like I said, I yeah. I didn't get an imaginary degree, Rachel. I didn't spend seven years getting an imaginary doctorate in zoomorphology. <laughs> so. Come in here and not not know my stuff. Oh my goodness! Can you move your tea, please, so that I can adjust? We have to move on to a new section. Yeah. Well, we'll let's move on to the next one then. Yeah. To the next cryptid. Yeah. This is this is going to be the last cryptid we cover today. Okay. We'll talk about other stuff later on. All right. Um, Don't worry. We will have more episodes because there are more cryptids we need to cover. Yeah. There's just there's a there's, there's a, lot just of a stuff. limited amount of there's time. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, the next one, anyway, the start of our story, it takes Does place... Does that look about half? Uh, Between there and there? Uh, maybe a wee bit. This yeah, one? there, somewhere there. Yeah, okay. Maybe. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, the the next story takes place in uh, Puerto Rico, the jewel of the Antilles, um, you know. <coughs> Colonization. Is it that kind of situation? Did they... I thought they might have got it from the... Spanish and the Spanish American War. Oh, and that's not colonization. Sorry, we're moving on from this topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because it's still called a colony. Um, I think they call. I think they have it classed as an American overseas territory. Territory. Like, yeah. like Guam. You know. Um. Except that, as I said, it's actually in the Caribbean. Um. Yeah, so this takes place in, in 1975, yeah? yeah? So when the story starts. And it starts in this town called, I'm pretty sure, Mocha. And what happens is that um, there's a series of livestock killings, you know? Mm -hmm. And people say... I couldn't find a number for how many... Killings but, of the goatiest goats? But there was a lot of... There's a lot of deaths going on at this time of livestock around this, this village, you know? Yeah. And I looked it up. At the moment, the population of that place is about 37,000, you know? Hmm. So I think in Ireland, that would be... That would be a large town, but maybe in other parts of the world, that's a village or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's, they, they describe it as a small village, a small agricultural village. Cool. Um, so there's this series of uh, things where livestock are found dead and the blood has been drained out of them from variously three puncture marks in the chest or sometimes puncture marks at the neck but the most common is from three puncture marks in the chest mm. and all the blood is soaked out of it yeah okay and nobody really knows what's going on and a lot of people in the area are losing animals like this you know um, and they get a bit freaked out and they chalk it up to this character El Vampiro de Mocha so the vampire the Mocha. vampire Mocha, yeah. yeah okay okay 
Um, and that's the crack. And that's 1975. Creepy. And the brouhaha kind of dies down a little bit. <laughs> brouhaha. Yeah. And then in March of 1995, yeah, mm-hmm. there's this lady, Madeline Tolentino. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's walking home. And around the town of Canovasas. I think that that's how you kind of assess. Kind of assess. Do you want to? You probably you probably be better at it. Where is it? Trying stuff in Spanish. Oh no 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 <laughs> nope. So like over oh, over. We're gonna the, anglicize this. <laughs> over Sorry. the months over the months leading up to March right nineteen ninety five. Yeah. Over one hundred and fifty animals in the area had gone missing. Ooh. Yeah. Missing. Well, they had, uh, or just deceased. They 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 got missing and then they're found a little bit later, and they they're reputedly drained of blood. You know, <sighs> so Madeline is walking home one night. Yeah, and she uh, claims she claims that she saw this creature, mm-hmm. and it was um, sucking the blood from a goat when she came upon it, <laughs> and it was about maybe three or four feet high and everything. Okay. Um, it was reptilian and it had spines down its back. Now, I'm going to show you another image. Like an anteater or something? I'm going to show you another image because this is... I am a sucker when someone draws something and then they annotate it. <laughs> I'm a sucker for it and I really love it. So okay. I'm going to show you this image. Let's see. Oh my goodness. This is actually... You can see she signed it, Madeline. <laughs> She drew it? Yeah, and she's dated it. It's it's on, um, oh, which are freaky. So this September happened in the March. 12th. That's September the 12th. Whereas I would have thought it was the 9th of December, you know. Phosphorescent, you... bright colored, spine-like appendages that run over the body from head to toe. Yeah, so it's got this layer of spines like a ridgeback on it with, with, with glowing that change Spine colors. Spine colors change constantly from red, red to, to blue, blue to, to yellow, yellow to green to orange to violet. So they're, they're cycling through these. <laughs> through like, the rainbow, basically. Like one of those LED things that, yeah, you, get, yeah, yeah, that yeah. you get on AliExpress or whatever. It was way, about, way before its time. Way before its time. Like that's so sick on TikTok right now. F- body colored, covered by fine gray fur um, with darker spots. Uh, strong feet with claws. <laughs> Four or five feet tall, big slanted red eyes, small holes for the nostrils, and a lipless mouth, thin arms with three fingered hands with claws. And no ears. Yeah. Only auditive holes. Yeah. Aud- aud- what, what? Auditive. No ears, only auditive holes. Yeah, it just holes in the side of the head. Like a, like a frog. Would you say, yeah, it's some, it's somewhat reptilian, like, isn't it? No lips, the nose is two holes. You know what I mean? Right. It's some, it's somewhat reptilian. But it has fur. She says parts. Yeah, it has fur. Yeah. And Um, socks. (laughs) And socks. Socks? I said spines. Did you say spines? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, who gave it the socks? (laughs) So it start. It's it starts off in Puerto Rico, you know. Yeah. And then it it just basically it spreads like wildfire, you know. Yeah. Like I was surprised that the first sighting of it was in 1995, you know, mm. because I remember being a teenager and my friend tried to explain to me what a chupacabra was, you know, that he had seen it on Sky Television. <laughs> now at the time, and I need you to brace yourself for the humanity in in this. Oh boy. Things were tough, Rachel. Back in the 90s in Ireland, we only had two television channels. And other than that, you had to get, like, cable. And this is Ireland in the 90s, so nobody had cable. Which was satellite. Probably better off. Yeah, so a friend of mine had it, and he was, like, trying to explain to me what this thing was. (laughs) I can only imagine. And that must have been around about the time that she saw it. You know, I can't imagine it was later than... I would have said it was earlier than 1995, but apparently it wasn't. So hmm. it was around about 1995. Yeah. So, so that's so Madeline saw this character. Have you ever seen? Um, well, no. Let's not go down that road yet. Wait. So, then okay. It's the, the, 
the sightings start to spread like wildfire, right? Right. Um, they're popping up all over the place in, in, in South and Central America, you know? They've seen one in Mexico. They've seen another one somewhere else. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, and they, they start to pop up all there. And then they start to see them kind of as far um, north as Maine, would you believe? Hmm. An awful lot of sightings around the Texas border, yeah? Of course. Now, you're lucky that I have an imaginary doctorate in zoomorphology. <laughs> because the creature, the, the attributes of the creature change. You what? Know? Yeah, it becomes, because how would you, we, you would characterize her version of it as reptilian humanoid, you know? Yeah. But then it changes as well, like, it can be almost like a, a feral hairless kind of character with more dog or wolf like kind of things you know there's even versions of it where it has bat like wings leathery wings you know oh hi um i've only seen the one that looks like do you know like a little like a like a sand shrew yes that's the, that's the modern that's like the modern version and you'll see a load of like there's oh sorry there's reports re, <laughs> there's reports recently um around texas and stuff where where it's taken on kind of dog-like characteristics and stuff like that you know okay but would it surprise you bearing in mind the character had spines down its back and it was changing color have you ever seen the movie species have i've heard of the movie species do um, i need to watch the trailer for it to get what you're about to say no i don't think so but then just just for in the interest of science i'll, I'll give it species of movie came out in about 1994 or 1995 yeah okay and um, h.r giger did the design for the creature in it it's a creature feature you know yeah um, and what it is is that human beings are recombining alien DNA, you know? Okay. And then um, they they get the DNA, they mix it with an, with this woman's DNA, you know? And then the creature that's born is this is this new species, half alien, half human. Mutant thing. Yeah. And it, it matures really fast. Even like, though it doesn't work that way. It, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, we're suspending belief. Yeah, I mean so, it's the movie. So it came out right. in 1995. Um, let me get some images of it up just to, like Madeline Tolentino had gone and seen this movie in the in the zoo or in the zoo in the zoo in the in the um in the theater at yeah just a short while before it. La, that's the that's the creature from that movie. Oh, okay. We're just looking at like the the movie poster and stuff, but you can see it's a woman with spines, yeah, and long talons. Yeah, you see, the story with the movie is is that she's 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 growing much quicker than you know normal, like yeah, yeah, and she's got this biological imperative to reproduce. Oh my! So she kind of morphed from this character into this supermodel. I think is it. Natasha, what's her name or something? Some at the time she was like a supermodel. You remember that when they invented supermodels? We were on about this time. <laughs> Honey, I was a I was a child. Well, <laughs> um, and you, you can see she doesn't look like a human all the time. They just put a human head on her. In fact, that's normally what she kind of looks like right there. Like a Star Trek character. So Madeline had seen that movie, and then that. I think that it's it's hard to deny that it hadn't <laughs> coloured her vision of what she saw that night, you know, with the spines yeah. down the back. And if you watch the movie, like, the the creature constantly is going all, you know, uh, purple and greeny and stuff. Hmm. And then it, it's got that quality as well where, you know, um, H.R. Giger designed the, the xenomorphs and stuff like that from Aliens and, you know, from the Alien movie. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, oh, they're called Xenomorphs? Yeah, the famous aliens from the Alien movie. Like, he designed all of that with the face huggers and the thing exploding. And I just remember the belly one. Yeah, the belly one. And so the he, big one. He's designed all that. Like, And basically, I, I, would, I read a book um, about him, uh, like a book that he had written. About did, he, did he make Predator as well? Um, 
I don't think so. Predator is way better and would totally win in a fight. I didn't to to the species alien. No, to alien alien. Oh, like in Alien versus Predator. I'm gonna have to look. At, I'm gonna have to look into that though. It's deeply. He, he's he's a. You know, he's a consummate artist in that. When you're reading his own descriptions of what's happening, you're like, I, I just, I don't see any of this. Like, yeah. You know, that kind of way. And he's got this series. He's a, he's a fascinating Uh-oh. guy, I mean, to be honest. But look, that's beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. Okay, sorry. We went on a tangent, but listen. Uh, d- there so, were facehuggers in Alien? The d- first one? The guys that jumped on the guy's face and it impregnates them and then the, the egg grows inside in your thing. Did you oh, watch Alien? Yeah. Well, listen. I, again. <laughs> Young. Oh, goodness. Um, so that's the crack. I mean, I don't know what to say about the, the Chupacabra, really. Um, like, there's an awful lot of stories. I'm surprised that it's as new as it is. Yeah, I thought it was older. And I, I did not know it was from Puerto Rico. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was Mexican. A lot of people think that. that Maybe there's something like it in mexico yeah that's the that's the the uh, like a in folk mythology they have this bat like creature or something like that you know Hmm. that's supposed to suck blood and then the the chupacabra and this character kind of got rolled together and that's the reports of chupacabras with wings you know Hmm. um interesting yeah um they like they think that it's um there's another guy that has this theory that th- because there's been a spate of uh, sightings in the last few years down on the border with um, Texas, you know, mm-hmm. and um, they kind of are suggesting that it is wild dogs like coyotes and stuff, mm-hmm. but that have mange. Um, oh, yeah, yeah so, that would make sense because they're like missing fur. Patches. Yeah, because they're missing fur and they they're they're so debilitated by this um, thing, which is it's the scabies mite, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's mange. Like so, the, all their fur falls off and they can't hunt. Um, I think so. They can't hunt wild animals anymore because they're physically wrecked from it. You know. Yeah. Um. So it's easier for them to go after livestock because they're in they're pinned in and they're easier to get. You know. Yeah. And then people see this thing that doesn't look like a coyote because it's, you know, had its fur is all gone and it's... It's wrecked. Yeah, it's running, it's basically <laughs> a destroyed dog, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's running around. So they, that's kind of what they blame all the recent sightings of Chupacabra on. Hmm. Um, I uh, think that's it. The other thing then is Chupacabra. I mean, I mean, but the, but the spines, but the glowy thing and that's that's just her other like and then don't over no that sir but from what i from what i've read like is that th- there's like it basically became one of these you know phenomena like you can see what happened there as well with the yeti like it all got real exciting mm-hmm. up until about for a 10 year period and then it fell down you know what i mean like the chupacabra in fairness still has legs you know um is it a cryptid? Uh, it's, yeah, you know, it's somewhere near a cryptid, like. But the problem is that people can't decide on its on its zoomorphology, you know? They keep they keep inventing different versions of it. I think it was just that one lady. But Madeline. Yes. But Madeline's the originator. But... Like, she was drawing on an older thing where they had all these unexplained... Um, but what about the folklore? There's no There's no folklore related to it. Um, except in uh, Mexico, where vampire bats are quite common, and basically what they're describing in the folklore is a large vampire bat, you know. And then there was the incident at at Mocha where they thought that it was animals that had had their blood drained, you know. Hmm. But did those animals have their blood drained? I mean, the only way to do that is to have an autopsy, because blood congeals pretty quickly, like hmm. you know, especially if you're in. Oh, let's say a tropical kind of dry environment, you know, like often these guys are found out in deserts and pastoral places. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's not that unusual for um, for any kind of animal that's preying on anything to, to grab it by the neck and put puncture wounds in the neck. You know, it's true. 
and then it's sitting out in the sun and it's getting drier and drier and drier and the skin is tightening and it pulls those holes open and you know what I mean? It looks like it's been drained. Yeah. This is the same. This is very similar to, to Linda Moulton Howe's stuff as well. Like all of the cattle mutilations. Who? Linda, Linda Moulton Howe. Like, a friend of mine. We talked about her before. She's the lady that started the uh, cattle mutilation stories. Okay. You know? And like it's it's easy to see like the, all of is the this cattle. Skinwalker Ranch kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure, why not? Um, not not really, no, 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 not really. It's part, it's it's kind of part of the UFO mythology. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, but again, she's this. finding them out in desert areas, like you know, where I mean, like you get a cut. Like you're an animal and you're ranging out there, like, and you get injured, you're probably going to die. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. People aren't really checking on you as such. You know, there's no rancher there all the time or whatever. You know. Well, now they have, they have cameras. <laughs> I'd, I could I could definitely see shepherd drones and stuff like that. Oh yeah, I mean, GPS for your sheep. <laughs> GPS. We t- we talked about this once that. Didn't we, weren't we going to do an app? Yeah. To check my sheep app, yeah? Yeah, yeah check yeah, my yeah, sheep. Yeah, yeah, sheep PS. Find my sheep. <laughs> were we actually going to call it sheep PS? Were, were we, were I we... don't remember. I don't recall that, but I do remember uh, we having... We tried to sell it to that, we tried to pitch it to that... Uh, to a farmer? To that farmer guy, yeah. yeah he was, he was kind of impressed, like... He what? He thought it was a real thing for he a minute. Did, he did think it was a real thing. And then we were like, how come it's not? And then he was like, where, where would you get them? And we were like, oh, it's not a real thing. We're just making it up. And he was like, actually sounds like a pretty good idea, though. <laughs> I presume someone's done it by now. That was years ago when we were thinking of that. If you know. <laughs> if that you're was, a farmer. Oh, it's genius. without a doubt. It has to be a real thing. like Because <laughs> those things are cheap enough, aren't they? Do you remember that was back when, when there was an app for everything? You know. Well, this is, what, 2014? It would have been Probably. about... 14 or 15 you know, years yeah, ago. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say we've been I'd say we've been pipped at the post there you know, with that. Pipped at the post? What? What? Like, like someone's beat pipped at the post. What like the someone's heck does someone's that mean? beat someone's beaten us to it. Oh. Do you know? Pipped. Yeah, have you never heard of that? To be pipped? No, I haven't. It's like in a race, you know, the post is the finish line. And then you just get pipped. They just get ahead of you just at the end. Nope. Well, <laughs> fine, Rachel. Thank you for that, James. Yeah. Um, so that's it. I mean, the chupacabra is again. It's not as it's not as interesting as as like because the, people don't have as the, the, none of the stories are in any way even slightly corroborated. They're not even good stories, really. Oh, do you know James, what I mean? That's um. You've given us quite quite the uh, entertainment this evening. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, but the the chupacabra is that a cryptid? Yeah, it could be. Do you know? But not the Hopkins goblin. The, no, the Hopkins goblin is not because it's implied <laughs> that it arrives on a spaceship. But the yeti is. But the yeti is, yeah. The yeti is basically just Himalayan Bigfoot. Yeah. So that's 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 what I'm like. The most interesting thing to me. As a zoomorphologist, is where the hoot nanny is. No, no, <laughs> please, Rachel. I'm a serious academic. I don't. I wouldn't have time for a hoot nanny. I could go to. Jambor- you could, yeah, I could go fit to in jamboree. a jamboree. I could, I could fit in a jamboree, but I gotta keep my head clear. You know, right, for, right, right. for the science thing, I'm doing. I did a lot of science. And, yeah, yeah. I gotta keep my head clear. Um, like it's the it's when you've got the primate cryptids. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, and I think we're, we're going to look at frogmen next. Frogmen, jackalope. The jackalope, yeah. And what was the other one? No, that was it. That was it. The that frog, was it. Frogman frogmen and, and the jackalope. Yeah. Will be next time. I haven't, excuse me, I haven't looked into the frogman yet, like, um, but it's right up my um, uh, area of um, special research interest, you know. Yeah. Is what is what I'm trying to say. 
I was going to try to make a pawn joke. I just couldn't get there in time. What, jo what pawn joke? Go for it. Just, just that, you know, it, you said it was right up your... I was going to try to put in a pawn thing. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 basically the end of that. That's the end of my, my admittedly pretty shoddy research this Zoo time around. Zoo zoomorpholo zoomorphology? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm a doctorate of zoomorphology from the University of uh, South Kerry. <laughs> the, that august institution. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, very good. Well, thank you very much for uh, sharing all of that information with us. We greatly appreciate it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And thank you for watching and continuing to come back for these weird and wacky episodes with Mr. Ray. Uh, thank you, darling. That's no problem. Um, Please don't feel uh, shy. Uh, go ahead and leave us a comment down below if you'd like to tell us anything, if you had experiences with any of these creatures, or if you know someone who has. De I'd love to hear these stories. I, I definitely would as well. Yeah. We love I reading the comments for these videos. So thank you very much. Um, and yeah, thank you. If this is your first time coming in here and you're like, what the heck is this? Uh, there will be a playlist that shows up here at the end of the video. I'm sorry, my, my hands are in the wrong place. There will be a playlist that shows up right here on the side of this screen so that you can go and watch the older episodes if you're interested in learning more about, uh, aliens or cryptids or just uh, Irish. We did Irish mythology stuff we did as well, a lot of Irish mythology, yeah, especially Irish around Samhain. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you all so much for joining us. We hope that you have a wonderful week ahead and I will see you all very soon in my next one. Take care, everyone. Bye, everybody. <laughs>